probably a very reasonable thing for you to be thinking right now is, who the fuck is this person? Um, I am a definite weirdo. Uh, I have the coolest job in the entire world. I'm a professional mad scientist. Uh, I started my career as a theoretical neuroscientist. Uh, so if you've never heard of that before, just substitute the word lazy for theoretical and you have the vision. So we build machine learning to study the brain. We study the brain to come up with better machine learning. Uh, it was a real blast. I love being a scientist. If everything in my life fell apart and I had to go back up onto campus and run my lab again, I would happily do it in a second. But about 12 years ago, I, uh, I live in the Bay Area. I got the entrepreneurial bug and I started a series of companies, AI in education and AI in the workplace. And I was the chief scientist of one of the very first companies using AI for hiring, which you may appreciate at this point is a pretty fraught industry. Uh, I got to explore all of these sorts of things and across all of them, what really bound it together was what makes an amazing life? What does it take to actually build an amazing person? And not just for the most elite performers, not just for a bunch of billionaires in Silicon Valley or elite performers in sports or on Wall Street or whatever it might be. But if you were talking about 8 billion people, what would studying the brain and work and education and creativity tell you? So in 20 minutes, somehow I'm supposed to convey not only what it is that makes an amazing life, but the role that creativity plays in it. And then because of the nature of this conference, the role that AI and machine learning is going to play, good and bad. Uh, I had some slides, uh, I had a talk, but it turns out what I've discovered over the last several years is I really love just coming out and talking. It was actually fascinating seeing the slides, you know, the survey results, where are people's passions. Uh, it's interesting to see AI uh, and machine learning on there at the top. Uh, believe me, I spend my time doing it. I believe in its power. Um, but the earlier statement that it in and of itself is not creative is 100% true. AlphaGo can be the best Go players in the world and it knows nothing about Go whatsoever. Um, on the other hand, for that one person in the audience that was all in for blockchain, oh my goodness, I've never seen a technology more in need of an actual problem to solve. Um, <laughs> but, Turns out it's a great way to scam people out of their money, though. So, um, so I get to do all of this cool stuff. And, and then I get to get on stage and talk about it. Uh, so what do I do now? We run this incubator where a bunch of mad scientists get together and we take problems, any kind of problem involving people, and we solve it for free. Uh, my life's been good to me. I get to lead an amazing life. And the idea that I could give that to someone else, someone um, that has manic depression. We built the first ever AI that could predict a manic episode just based using people's phones. When my son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, I got to hack all of the devices attached to his body. Turns out I broke several federal US laws and build the first ever AI to treat diabetes. Right now, we're developing a system called software-based gaze tracking, so we can watch where people are looking on a screen. It can just run in the background, and it never needs to share data off the device. Nothing goes to my server or anyone else's. We're developing it to track the progression of Parkinson's. But we're also looking at it for when a little kid is watching a video, so we can actually bring the parent in afterwards and say, hey, you know, your kid was really interested in this relationship between Bert and Ernie, and we might need a conversation about uh, what it means for two men to really care for each other. Um, and it doesn't stop there. The government of Singapore came to me and said, wow, we want to be a world center for AI research. What does it take to actually attract the kind of people that will drive that in Singapore? And the Secretary General's office of the UN had a somewhat similar question with their purview, and it's about being creative. All these transformations are about being creative, and we get the chance to do this. People walk in, 
and ask for help, and I'm in this amazing position where not only do we get to help, but we literally get to give it away for free. So what has all my research shown me about creativity? Over the weekend, I was up at MIT. There was a conference on neurotechnologies. So we brought a whole bunch of scientists together from Stanford and MIT and Harvard and beyond and a bunch of billionaires, so Eric Schmidt was there, and Reid Hoffman, and people looking to put money in this space. Uh, if you're wondering, uh, you know, the kind of entrepreneurs that gave you Facebook and Google uh, now see your brain as greenfield for their next companies, which genuinely, do you want Facebook in your brain, uh, is a reasonable question to ask. But when you look at the actual science of what we get to do, and I have a bunch of startups in this space also, it's actually fascinating. So one of the technologies one of my startups has developed um, is called transcranial alternating current stimulation along the midline theta. Mm, whatever. So you slap a thing to your head, and you are instantly smarter. Have you ever heard the old, I don't know, some of the crowd, I see people of my generation, and some of you, well, fuck you for being young. Um, so, um, uh, you slap this little patch on your head. You know the old Simon game? So it was like lights and colors and a pattern. You had to remember which sequence they were in. And as you get up to like six, seven length sequences, for most people, it's hard remembering what the next one is. So you put the little patch on, and instead of doing five, six, seven length sequences, you can do seven, eight, nine length sequences. And that may not sound trivial, but in my work, where I get to literally track the life outcomes of 100 million people, turns out that little change means you earn $30,000 more across your lifetime. You live five to eight years longer, and you earn more money, and you go further in your education. It's like, these are the sorts of things people would want in their life. This is what I would love to give someone. Uh, now, of course, this sort of thing eventually be commercialized for everyone. My interest is in kids with traumatic brain injury. So one of the most common symptoms of traumatic brain injury, whether you're a soldier on the battlefield or a little kid uh, that had a bicycle accident or was abused, or you may not know this, just grew up in a high-stress household. Millions of kids every year, what they were born with is taken away causally at a molecular level by stress. What if you could give that back to them? So you may not think of the kind of work that I do as creative work, but it is. Science and engineering is fundamentally creative. It just so happens I also get to get up on stage and sort of be a professional pompous jackass as well, which is also a creative experience. And now I get to write books, and it turns out screenplays, like I was in New York recently, and this person walked up to me afterwards and said, you're a really fucking weird person. Would you be interested in working on a TV show? And I said, yeah, well, yes, this, this would be awesome. Um, I'm a huge, oh my god, I watched so many hours of Gilgan's Island when I was little. I'm, I'm happy to admit it, uh, if you grew up in the 70s, it wasn't like the Breaking Bad era. You mainlined terrible, terrible television, and, uh, and it defined who you were. Um, but what's amazing is you can come out with so much more than that. Uh, so I'm up at MIT, and I'm watching this stuff. And it turns out, not only can I slap this thing on you and increase your working memory span, I can do a different kind of stimulation and increase your creativity. I can slap a little patch on you, and, and electrically stimulate parts of your prefrontal cortex. And let's put it this way. Uh, there's a famous little psychological experiment where I give you a box full of Legos, and you put them together, and I say, come up with as many different creations out of these Legos as you can in the next five minutes. Go. And this is how psychologists tend to think about things like creativity. At the very least, it gives us some sense. All right, in the moment, how many different ideas can you come up with? It's a pitching in a writer's room. You know, just how many dumb jokes right now, or good jokes, ideally, that you can come up with in the moment. And you can actually put this patch on and increase the number. Okay, about 10%, and this is just external. My actual passion, what I went to grad school for, I want to build cyborgs. 
And I literally get inside your head, jam things in there, and make you smarter. And unambiguously, this is achievable for those of you that survived the surgery. So I will take volunteers uh, afterwards. Uh, I'm sure this will be great for your career or for whoever inherits the, uh, the insurance payout. So, um, but here's the thing. Halfway in, I'm actually getting to something, is I slap this thing on you and it makes you come up with more ideas. You are in some basic sense more creative. That doesn't do anything if you don't have the courage to tell people what you believe. I was giving a talk recently to a room about a little less smaller than this, but a similar crowd, and they were chief innovation officers and chief technology officers. And near the end of this talk, uh, you know, these are big industry. These are people that notoriously spend trillions of dollars a year supposedly on innovation, and yet, you know, do you feel like you have $1.5 trillion worth of innovation in your life? Not really for me. Um, so he said really bluntly and frankly, like, I'm in this giant company. I, I don't understand how can I get my team to innovate? And I just said something in the moment which probably came across as very harsh, and I was surprised at how well taken it was, which is, you know, if the cost of losing your job is greater than doing what's right, then you can't innovate. If you can't walk away from whatever you're doing, then you can't truly do something worthwhile. If you can't tell someone a truth because you're afraid that they won't hire you again on freelance, or they won't uh, keep you on staff, or the audience won't get your sense of humor, you're not being creative. Creativity is not simply exploring the unknown. It is that. And let me tell you, as much as I love building AI, machine learning systems, that's what they can't do. They cannot explore the unknown. Maybe someday, some jerk like me is going to build that, and we even have ideas about where we're going in this space. But right now, Artificial intelligence is fundamentally a tool. And you're the artists. It is a huge mistake to think that AI will solve our problems for us. However, taking creative people that know how to explore the unknown and have the courage to do what they think is right, that's fundamentally what creativity is about. And if you can't, Say what you believe. If you can't be true to yourself, you can't be a CIO. I don't believe you can be an artist. You can't be a scientist. You sure as hell can't be the Attorney General of the United States. <laughs> if your job is worth more to you than your responsibility to the country, then we're all fucked. <laughs> so where does that leave us? So, I get this thing where I get to study people and I get to study machines at the same time. And of course, what I want to do in the ideal is put them together. That may sound like the board to you, but actually what we can augment in people is anything. The whole point is, what about you could we lift up? And it can be your creativity. I love the idea of a cyborg who actually were augmenting their emotions and they're able to introspect better and understand themselves, whatever it might be. But I will say this, when we say creativity is future-proof, it's true. The fundamentals of creativity, as far as we can see, and boy, that future is very murky, but as far as we can see, that creativity is future-proof, but not if you can't be honest. Not if you can't share yourself in your work. This probably doesn't sound like the sort of thing you normally hear out of a scientist, but let me put it this way. Jerks like me build AIs to take people's jobs. Now, that doesn't mean C-3PO shows up and taps someone on the shoulder and says that you're out, you're fired, that's my seat now. But what it does mean is uh, something very different than is covered in a lot of the press. 
A lot of the press is about how will warehouse workers survive automation? What about taxi drivers? Uh, you know, I try not to think about this too much, but at one point Uber reached out to me and said, would you be interested in being chief scientist at Uber? Uh, and I said, hell no. What? Uh, you couldn't pay me $10 million to be in a loan in a room with Travis Kalanick. Um, so the thing is, now they're going to IPO this year, and that statement will become true. Um, uh, I will try not to obsess over that. But, um, but the truth is, building robots to do those kinds of jobs is phenomenally difficult and enormously expensive. And the genuinely sad truth is, the humans will just work for less. Um, will AI create more jobs than it destroys? Yeah, it actually will. But is this the next industrial revolution? Well, no. It will create this huge mass of service industry jobs that have no agency, no meaningfulness, low wage power, and it will create all these amazing creative jobs. But how do we understand that work? Think of it this way. If you are doing a job right now, creative or otherwise, as you see it, if I could hire anyone with a similar background and a similar education and plug them into that job and get the same output out, your job is not long for this world. And that might sound really scary. If someone like me can build an AI to do all of that rote work, even rote creative work, I love, I've been watching uh, Tuca and Birdie recently. Uh, if you haven't seen it on Netflix, go check it out. Uh, if you like BoJack Horseman, uh, except you really wanted it to be about 30-year-old um, women you know, with their tits flapping out, um, enjoying the world, then go see it. It's great. But in the sense that only this woman could come up with this, and, and we you know, send out all the animation to be finished overseas, Boy, give it five or ten years, and I guarantee you that you could give it a few frames and it could reproduce all of that stuff. You can just say, hey, you know what? I got this scene. Bertie and Tuca are going to be going to the hospital, and there should be some sort of alligator taxi that takes them there, and uh, here's the kind of color scheme I want, and it would spit all of that out. I don't really see that as terribly creative, because there was nothing to that that actually contained in anyone's unique vision. So what is left after all that sort of stuff gets animated? If creativity is not simply the ability to draw a picture or write a story or run an experiment, if creativity is fundamentally what makes you unique, well, that's an amazing story. As scary as it might be to many, to people like you in the audience, this should be incredibly heartening. Because it means that the future of work is what makes you different. The thing that makes you uniquely different is your only value. When I bring someone into my lab or into one of my companies, I only have one question. I don't care if you can program. I don't care if you know anything about brains or artificial intelligence. I can teach you all of that. That's all boring to me. I care that you will have had an idea that I wouldn't have. Now, that's something that I bet you as creatives really get. Whether you're writers or, or visual artists or musicians, it's about having an idea that no one else would have had. More and more, machines can turn those visions into reality. But the visions are ours. They are what make us special. What I'm worried about is that few of us have the courage to share our vision with the world. And I don't just mean you. I mean everyone. I mean 8 billion people. Because no one's going to want to be on the wrong side of this massive divide between the creative economy and everything else. And I fundamentally believe everybody can do it. I know sometimes that sounds controversial, but my research, hundreds of millions of people, everyone can be amazing. I wouldn't build what I build if I didn't believe that. You can change a life. 
and you want to know what it is, that final ingredient for creativity around exploring the unknown, it isn't just about creating meaning. It's that you have meaning in your life. You have a sense of purpose, something that is bigger than you, something that will take more than a lifetime to complete. Your career is not your purpose. Your job is not your purpose. I always like to say, the world gets better when old men plant trees. That's a purpose. You will never rest under the shade of that tree. You're doing it entirely for someone else. But here's the most amazing thing about that. Those people that plant trees, like you, these creative trees that go on to live inside someone's mind, that change who they are, those people live longer, they earn more money, they walk faster when they're 65 years old, they have more friends, they're actually happier. You want an amazing life? Then give it to someone else. So thank you very much.